Now we're going to move to essentially how to handle such situations. Sometimes um, you can't avoid non-compliance. So for instance, if your treatment is implemented through emails, people sometimes don't read emails um, and you will have one-sided non-compliance. Or they might have forwarded their emails um, their email, the treatment email to a friend who happens to be in the control condition, then you will have two-sided treatment uh, non-compliance. So the main te technique that we're going to use both in our design and in our data analysis is called the instrumental variable uh, analysis. This is a really important tool for empirical analysis for causal inference. So sometimes we, we just call an instrumental variable instrument. So in, the, in this unit of the lecture, I sometimes use the abbreviation IV for instrumental variables. I sometimes use instrument. And you know this is common practice. So if you listen to other lectures, you'll find the same thing. So one way to um, control for or account for non-compliance is to use the IV regression approach. So IV can be generated ex ante or before you start the experiment. So for example, you can randomize the promotions. You can use an encouragement design, uh, or you can use randomized offering of a program. We'll use an example for that. And so what we're going to do here is to talk about the general principles behind IVs. And we're going to focus on the uh, randomized promotion or the ex ante focus in the experiment design and uh, talk about how IV can be used to deal with noncompliance. So let's use uh, an example to start, start off this, um, this uh, unit. So let's say we want to evaluate a, a voluntary job training program. First of all, if it's a government program, usually any unemployed person is eligible. So we have universal eligibility. But only some people might choose to register to participate, and other people might choose not to register. So we call the first subset the participants, and the second subset non-participants. So when such things happen, which happens to almost all government programs, there are some simple ways to evaluate how good the program is. How do you evaluate it? Then you, you look at the participants, and you look at you know, what is the likelihood that they find a job after they participate in the program. We can also collect information about their wages uh, for their new jobs. Uh, we can also look at what happens to those who didn't participate and compare them. This is a very simple approach, and it's often used, but it's not so good. So um, you can even use the before and after. Remember diff and diff? So the, the third bullet it says, compare situations of participants and non-participants before and after. Right? That's the diff and diff that we talked about in lecture three. In fact, none of these would be good approaches to evaluate the program. Why is that? Why is it not so good? So let's just take a look at the, uh, the approach where we compare those who participate versus those who did not participate, who do not participate. Okay, why is this the wrong approach? So the key here is selection bias. Okay, so in this case, we can write down a regression model where y is the outcome variable. It could be a binary variable. You know, did the person uh, find a job afterwards? Or it could be a continuous variable. W what was the wage of the new job? Um, so we can write down a linear model where p is a dummy variable, where um, p equals 1 if the person participates in the training program and 0 otherwise. And x is a vector of control variables, such as age, gender, you know, number of years of education, and so on. And epsilon is the residual. So why is this approach not a good approach? Um, we have two problems. One is what's called the omitted variable problem. So variables that we omit for various reasons, sometimes because we can't observe them, 
but are actually important. The second one is what I mentioned before, which is selection bias. So the decision to participate in training is endogenous. Um, it's not randomly assigned. So there might be uh, characteristics which decide who participates and who don't. So let's look at the first problem first, which is the omitted variable bias. Even if we try to control for everything, we'll miss characteristics that we don't know they mattered and characteristics that are too complicated to measure. So some of these uh, could be talent and motivation. You know, people who are more motivated are more likely to participate, but we can't actually observe those. So the level of information and access to the service might be different. So some people are more informed, so they know that such job training opportunities exist and they participate. Uh, the opportunity cost of participation might also differ. You know, for someone with young children at home, the opportunity cost of participation is higher than someone with, you know, grown children uh, who are out of the house. So when you write down the correct model, the full model, you will have, you know, y equals gamma zero the intercept gamma 1 times uh, x. You remember x is the, uh, the characters of each participants. Uh, gamma 2 times p, which is the participation dummy variable. And gamma 3 times m1. m1 captures everything that we cannot observe. We can also call this the missing variable, the unobserved variables. So this is the, the true model, but unfortunately, we don't observe M1. Okay, so to recap, the true model actually includes uh, these uh, omitted variables which are important, might be important, but we're actually estimating a model that does not include the M1s, the, uh, the, these characteristics. In this case, if M1 and, and participation decision are correlated, then the OLS estimators of beta 2 you know, the effect of participation on the outcome will not be a consistent estimator of gamma 2, uh, which is the true impact of the program. Why is that? So when m1 is missing from the regression, then the coefficient of p, participation, will pick up some of the effects of m1. So the estimates is not precise. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the endogenous decision to participate. So the true model, let's say the true model is um, the first equation, which is y equals gamma 0 plus gamma 1x, you know, the characteristics, personal characteristics, plus gamma 2 times the participation decision, plus eta, where p is determined, so p, the decision to participate, is determined by the second equation, which is pi naught plus pi 1x plus pi 2 times m2 plus psi. So m2 is the vector of unobserved or missing characteristics. So we don't fully know why people decide to participate, but that's the set of uh, characteristics that determine the participation decision. So this is the endogeneity problem. So if we don't observe m2, then we can only estimate a simplified model, which is the original model, y equals beta naught plus beta 1 times x plus beta 2 times p plus epsilon, which is essentially missing the, the m2s. Um, in this case, is beta 2 still an unbiased estimator of gamma 2? So we know that OLS um, has to, OLS estimator has to satisfy the blue um, assumptions? Um, the answer is no. So when we estimate this equation, uh, whereas the true model is captured by this set of two equations, y equals gamma 0 plus and so on, whereas p equals pi naught plus pi 1x plus pi 2m2 plus psi, is beta 2, the OLS, um, the coefficient for participation, is that an unbiased estimator of gamma 2? Uh, the answer is no. Why, why that's, that's the case? 
um, it's because P, the participation decision, and the residual are correlated. And you know, these are three lines. So if you want to know why they are correlated, what the correlation is, you can just uh, break the right-hand side into three parts and, and look at each part. So if there's correlation between the missing variables and the outcomes not explained by observed characteristics, epsilon, then the OLS estimator will be biased. So again, what you estimate from the first equation on top uh, is not the true effect. Um, so what can we do to solve this problem? Uh, a very commonly used practice is the instrumental variable approach. So let me define formally what an instrument is. So an instrument is a variable that determines the endogenous regressor. So in our example, it's the participant, participation decision, but only affects the dependent variable through its effect on the independent variable. In other words, it does not, the instrument cannot affect the dependent variable directly. Okay, so let's say we want to estimate this equation, y equals beta naught plus beta one x plus beta two p plus epsilon here. Remember, p participation is an endogenous decision or might be an endogenous decision. So the problem here is the correlation between p and epsilon. So that leads us, gives us a biased estimator when we use OLS. So the idea of the instrument is we want to replace p with something else. And the universal definition for an instrument is z. So the z has to satisfy two criteria. The first one is Z needs to be correlated with P. Remember, we're replacing P with Z, so Z has to be correlated with P. But Z is not correlated with epsilon. So let's go back to our job training program to see how this might work. OK, so again, P is the participation decision. And epsilon is the residual, which is the part of the outcomes that's not explained by program participation or by the observed characteristics. So what I'm doing, or what you will be doing, is to look for a variable z that is correlated with participation p, but does not directly affect people's outcome y, other than through its effect on participation. So this variable must be coming from the outside. You want this variable to be exogenous. So how do we create an outside variable for the job training program? So this is when experimental variation might be very useful. Okay, Let's say that a social worker visits unemployed people to encourage them to participate in the job training program. But she only visits 50% of the people on her roster, and she randomly chooses whom she visits. OK, so you can see that this is coming from outside. Where I'm creating an instrument. OK, if she's effective, then many people she visits will enroll. Uh, when she visits, she can talk about the program. She can explain the benefit, the potential benefits of the program. So because of this, there will be a correlation between receiving a visit and enrolling. Notice that enrolling is our p, our endogenous variable. But the visit does not have a direct effect on the outcome. So for instance, your salary after you finish the training program, you go look for a job, you get you know, the, uh, your income should not be affected by the visit, except from its effect through enrollment in the training program. So this is what we call a randomized encouragement design, or um, we can also, in this particular case, it's promotion visits. And this is a good candidate for an instrumental variable. So in fact, in this example, we're going to use this as the instrument. Again, it satisfies both criteria. First, it's um, outside, it's exogenous, right? The experimenter or the, the social worker flips a coin to decide who receives treatment. So it's not correlated with the residual epsilon. 
And it is, we can check that it should be correlated with the decision to participate. And it's not, the visit itself does not determine the outcome, such as people's wages after they finish the training program, except through the participation in the training program. So it seems to satisfy all of these criteria. So now let's be more general, and we'll talk about the characteristics of an instrumental variable. So we just define this variable z. So in this particular case, and in many cases in experiment design, z equals 1 if the person was randomly chosen to receive the encouragement visit from the social worker, and it's 0 otherwise if the person was randomly chosen not to receive the encouragement visit from the social worker. Now we're defining two concepts. One is called the inclusion restriction. So in the sense that the correlation between your instrument z and the endogenous variable p should be positive. In other words, people who receive the encouragement visit are more likely to participate than those who don't. The second one is called the exclusion restriction. So the correlation between your instrument z and epsilon, the residual, is zero. So there should be no correlation between receiving a visit and the benefit to the program apart from the effect of the visit on participation. So in this case, again, z is called an instrumental variable or simply an instrument. So we're going to talk about analysis using instrumental variables. So a very commonly used regression method is called the two-stage least squares. So remember the original model with endogenous p, y, which is, let's say, wage or income, uh, equals beta naught plus beta 1 times x, you know, personal characteristics, plus beta 2 times p, which is the decision to participate, plus epsilon. Step 1, um, so this, you, you basically break the estimation problem down into two parts. So in the first part, you regress the endogenous variable on the instrument, z, and other exogenous variables. So I'm going to basically regress p, the participation decision, equals delta naught, the intercept, plus delta 1, x, plus delta 2 times z, the instrument, plus tau, the residual. So this would enable you, after running the regression, this would enable you to calculate the predicted value of p for each of the observations, and we call this p hat. Um, so use hat for predicted value is fairly common in statistics. Since z and x are not correlated with epsilon, then neither will be uh, p hat. So this is your predicted value. So how do you calculate your p hat? Your p hat is going to be, so this is the estimated participation decision, would be your estimated intercept, delta naught, plus the estimated coefficient on x, so that's delta 1 hat, plus the estimated coefficient on the instrument, delta 2 hat. Okay, so this is your predicted value. So this is step one. Now we're going to look at step two, or stage two. Then we can regress y on the predicted value p and the other exogenous variables. So the new equation is going to be y equals beta naught plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 p hat plus epsilon. So here the st you have to be careful that the standard errors of the second stage OLS need to be corrected because p hat is not a fixed regressor. In practice, uh, the command uh, should automatically does the two steps at once um, and reports the standard, um, the, the correct standard error. So that's already being adjusted. So the intuition behind the two stage d squares is that by using z for p, we cleaned p of its correlation with eta. 
Um, so we'll basically find something that's exogenous, which is the instrument for the endogenous variable, which is highly correlated with the endogenous variable P, participation. Then we clean, we clean the, the endogenous variable of its correlation uh, with eta. It can also be shown under certain conditions that the IV coefficient, beta 2 IV, yields a consistent estimator of gamma 2. So this you can find, you can find the proof in standard statistics textbooks. So now the question remains, where do we find instrumental variables? You know, it works like magic, but how do we find it? Where do we find it? You can generate your data set and then search for an IV ex post after your experiment. This is hard and risky. A much better approach is to generate an instrument with your experiment design before you run the experiment. So if everyone, so in the job training program, if everyone's eligible to participate in treatment, but some have more information than others, and those who have more information will be more likely to participate, then you can provide this additional information on a random basis. You know, we went through the example of social worker visiting a random subsample of the households to provide encouragement. We can also randomly choose a subset to, you know, deliver, let's say, information brochures or emails um, so that a random subset have more information than the others. So now let's link it back to the estimation formula. Remember in stage one, we regress the participation on training decision on a dummy variable for whether the person received additional visit, where the additional visit is randomized by the experimenter. So that's the linear model. Then we compute the predicted value of participation p hat. In stage two, we regress the outcome variable, the wages, on the predicted value of participation.